We also have some terminology here that we need to talk about before we can start our approximations. Suppose that A to B is a closed interval containing n subintervals. So here our subintervals look like this, x0, x1, x1, x2, next would be x2, x3, and so on, until we cover the whole interval. Of equal length, x delta x equals b minus a divided by n, with a equal to x0, that is the leftmost point, and b equal to xn, that is my rightmost point. The endpoints of the subintervals are called grid points, and they create a regular partition of the interval a to b. The kth grid point is x equals a plus k times delta x. So really what we're doing is we're taking this interval here, so from a to b, and we're saying, okay, I want to cut this up into a certain number of intervals. Uh, sub interval. So actually let's give an example here. Let's say I want to um, I'm gonna my my overall interval that I'm gonna be working on is 1 to 7. So okay here's 1 over here here's 7. I might say okay I want to break this up into let's say n equals 4 sub intervals. So that looks like this. And my goal here is that this subinterval right here is about the same length as this subinterval, is about the same length as this subinterval, is about the same length as this subinterval. So all of these subintervals are exactly the same length. And the length here is delta x equals b minus a divided by n. So I'm just taking this one really big interval and I'm chopping it up into smaller pieces. The endpoints of each one of these subintervals are called our grid points. Here we don't have our grid points. Let's actually find our grid points. Let's find our delta x. Let's create this regular partition. So the first thing I would need to do is find delta x. Delta x is b minus a, so 7 minus 1. That's just the length of the interval divided by n, which is 4. That's how many pieces you want to cut it up into. So I have an interval that's six units long. If I cut it up into four equal pieces, I would end up with three halves, or let's just use decimals here. Let's say 1.5. So that means that each one of these pieces should be 1.5 units long. I've broken this whole interval up into 1.5 long pieces, four pieces of, one, uh, of length, 1.5. So if I want to, if I'm starting here at 1 and I want to figure out, well, what's the next endpoint of my subinterval? Well, I'm moving 1, moving 1 1.5 away from 1. So 1 plus 1.5, this would be, let's do this in red, how about 2.5? And then I say, okay, well, I want to move another 1.5 away, so I'll add in another 1.5. This time I should end up with 4. And I want to add in another 1.5. If I add in another 1.5, I should have 5.5. You can kind of check your work here. If you add 1.5 one more time, we should end up with 7. So these numbers, 1, 2.5, 4, 5.57. These are called grid points, which is not a term that we'll use all that often, but it's going to be really important in this next definition is, is how we use these grid points. So here again, this is just we're just taking this one big interval and we're cutting it up into smaller subintervals. We're not always going to use n equals 4. They may say n equals 6 or n equals 5 or n equals 10. Um, it just depends on the problem. Um, this is kind of helping us to create our rectangles that we talked about in the last video. That would be n would be the number of rectangles that we have. So let's talk about our next definition here. So suppose that f is defined on a closed interval a to b, which is divided into n subintervals of equal length delta x equals b minus a divided by n. This piece that I just read right now, this is just saying, hey, we have a regular partition. It's a very fancy way to say, oh, we have a regular partition, which just means I'm cutting it up into n equal pieces.
It says if x, and actually I have a typo here, this should be x k star is any point in the kth subinterval, so if it's any point between x sub k minus 1 and x sub k, then f of x 1 star times delta x pl plus f of x 2 star times delta x plus blah 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 blah. This is all called a Riemann sum for f on this interval. And before I get into that, I want to talk about what each one of these represents. So if I go back to my example that I just drew right here, uh, we, we did 1 to 7. So starting at 1, going all the way to 7, let's say my function looks something like this. So in this case here, we said, okay, this would be uh, 2.5, and then you've got 4, and then 5.5. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying, okay, you can pick any number in this subinterval. So it doesn't matter which one. We'll talk about which ones are kind of the best choice in just a second. But let's say I pick, I don't know, this point right here. I'm going to use that as the height. So I'm going to plug that into my function. So this would be f of x1 star. That's the height times this distance right here, that's delta x. If I take f of x1 star times delta x, that would tell me the area of this red rectangle that I've created. So f of x1 star times delta x, that's this guy right here. And then I'm basically just repeating this process. f of x2 star times delta x. This time we might say, okay, how about um, how about this guy right here? We'll use this as the height, and okay, here's our rectangle. It's, it's not a very good rectangle. It's not very straight, but hey, there we go. It looks something like this, and I can find the area under that rectangle. That is f of x2 star times delta x, and well, we just are adding the two areas together. And we're just doing this process over and over and over and over again. This is the Riemann sum. And this is actually kind of what we were getting at last time, is we're saying, okay, we're, we're, we're using rectangles here, we're using these different rectangles to help us approximate the area under the curve. The problem is, if you're completely arbitrary in how you choose x, your, your grid points, your, your um, I should say the height of your rectangles, it's, it's just, it's very arbitrary, and we don't like that. At least I don't like that. So we're going to talk about how we would choose different points because there may be some instances in which we want to choose one specific type of point or another specific type of point. So a left Riemann sum uses the left endpoint of each subinterval for x sub k star. So if you're looking at the actual partition, we said, okay, here's 1 to 7. Here's 4, 2.5, and we said 5.5 here. So if I'm looking at, I'm going to alternate between red and black. If I'm looking at this subinterval right here, I would choose 1 for the height of my function. If I'm looking between 2.5 and, and 4, I would use 2.5 as the height of my function. If I'm looking at uh, 4 to 5.5, I would choose 4 as the height of my function. And if I'm looking between 5.5 and, and 7, I would choose 5.5 to be the height of my function. So I'm going to draw in just a little picture of what this would look like here. We've been drawing hey, this function that looks something like this. Let's say here's 1, um, here's 7. So when I create my triangles, or excuse me, my rectangles, I'm always using the left endpoint. So let's say here's one, here's one, here's one. So I'm always using the left endpoint to determine the height of each one of these rectangles. So my Riemann sum would look something like this, and I would find the area of each one of these blue rectangles. That's what a left Riemann sum looks like. Hopefully we can predict then a right Riemann sum. Well, instead of using the left endpoint, we're going to use the right endpoint. So here if I say, uh, let's see, 4, let me just divvy this up. We got 4, we got 2.5, we got 5.5, oops, 
five and a half, we got seven, we got one. So if I'm looking at this part of my subinterval, if I'm looking, or excuse me, this particular subinterval between one and two and a half, I would choose two and a half as my height. If I'm looking between two and a half and four, I would choose four as the height of that subinterval. If I'm looking between four and five and a half, I would choose five and a half to determine the height of my rectangle. And then between five and a half and seven, I would use seven to determine the height of my rectangle. So this time, if I kind of try and draw the same function here, this time if we say, okay, here's one, here's seven. Um, let's draw in our x-axis, and then we've got points right here, right here, and right here. And actually, let's do this in red this time. So this time, if I'm looking at this particular subinterval right here, I'm going to use the right endpoint. So this time, I have something that looks like this. For this piece, I'm using the right endpoint. So I'm going to have something that looks like this, and something that looks like this, something that looks like this. Here is my right Riemann sum. These two look a little bit different. In, a left, in, in the left Riemann sum here, we had this little bit of area that we were kind of not counting. That's not covered by our rectangles. We're not counting enough area. Here for our right Riemann sum, we have the opposite problem. We have this little bit of overhang on each one of our rectangles that's, that's counting too much area. We don't want either one of those. But if your function is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, you're going to end up with one of these. If it is increasing and decreasing, you're going to you're going to under approximate on some sub intervals, over approximate on others, and that's just the way it is. A midpoint Riemann sum, we won't use midpoint Riemann sums mostly just because um, they're kind of a pain, and I don't really like to use them. Um, a right Riemann sum would say use the midpoint, or excuse me, the, the midpoint Riemann sum would just use the midpoint of each subinterval. It tries to split that difference. So if we say, okay, here's our function. Uh, here's one. Here's seven. Here is four, two and a half, five and a half. So when I look at each subinterval, we'll do this one in green. So if I look between one and two and a half, it would aim to split that difference. It would say, I'm going to choose the midpoint as the height of my rectangle. And what we hope to end up with is we hope to end up with a little piece that we're overestimating and then a little piece that we're underestimating and that we can sort of get a little bit closer. Again, we can sort of just split the difference. So between two and a half and four, you would find the midpoint there between those two and then use that to determine the height of your rectangle. So I've got this rectangle, I've got this rectangle. My next one between four and five and a half, I would use this point right here to determine the height of my rectangle. So I have something which looks like this. And then between five and a half and seven, one more, something that looks like this. So it's not a perfect solution, but it generally will get you a better approximation than strictly a left endpoint or a right endpoint. But the calculations required, especially if the partition is ugly, um, is, is not going to be particularly fun to work with. So um, we're mostly, when we calculate these Riemann sums, we're mostly gonna be looking at left and right Riemann sums. Um, but just be aware that a midpoint Riemann sum is another approximation. There's actually even another approximation where we estimate with trapezoids instead. We're not going to get into that, like I said. For now, let's just stick with left and right Riemann sums. And we'll take a, a look at a few examples in the next video.